So I do think we're, you know, whether it's that or that, we're all doing better simulations. Welcome, uh, everyone. Um, we uh, just had a, a, a nice see colloquium by Chris uh, Fryer. We have a number of uh, visitors, uh, including uh, Selma Dimit, who will give the CFA colloquium later today, and she will also speak at lunch. Uh, I also wanted to welcome uh, Steve Murray back uh, to our building. <laughs> it's great to see you. Great to see you too, Ali. Um, and uh, one thing that I learned last night that I should mention, we both, uh, Josh uh, Greenlee and I, were at a public uh, event at the Cambridge Library, and that was to celebrate a book by uh, Marsha Artusia, yes, uh, that wrote a book about black holes. And uh, the name black holes is commonly attributed to John Wheeler, as many of you know. Turns out she looked into that and searched the literature very carefully. And it's actually Bob Dickey that came up with it. Uh, about five years earlier, yeah. And uh, she has evidence for that, and she put it in this book. So, if any of you mentioned in a popular talk, uh, the name, the origin of the name of the uh, black hole, and you should attribute it to Bob Dickey. And John Wheeler never did that. He was probably not asked about it. He just used it and he like, assumed that he was the initiator. Uh, but then, yeah, Bob Dickey, you refer to it as a place where you throw things, at, uh, even you know, like casually, you throw things that you want to disappear. Uh, and that name is stuck. Um, anyway, um, Getting to the program today, um, Peter Williams from the CFA will start, and he will talk about measuring the rotation period and magnetic field of the T6.5 brown dwarf measured from periodic radio bears. Uh, he's supposed to set the stage and, and show uh, an example of how to finish in 10 minutes. <laughs> All right. And then uh, Eugene Churrasov is visiting us from MPA uh, over there, and uh, he will talk about Type 1A supernova, uh, SN2014J in gamma rays. Uh, he gave a talk at the High Energy Division yesterday. Uh, then we hear from Selma, who is visiting all the way from Amsterdam, hopefully without the jet lag by now. She came here at the beginning of the week. Um, and she will talk about the mysterious multiple populations in global clusters. And finally, we'll hear from Chris uh, Fryer, uh, visiting us from Los Alamos. And he will tell us about high Z opacities and kilonova emission. Some of us wonder where you got the tables for the high uh, Z opacities. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Peter. All right. Thank you, Avi. In an era of characterizing exoplanets, not just detecting them, but learning things about them, uh, these two plots are just quick things summarizing kinds of the kinds of things that people do, uh, specifically people around here. Uh, this is the transmission spectrum of uh, the Super Earth GJ1214b, uh, worked by Zach Berta. This is uh, plotting planetary mass versus radius and seeing where exoplanets land, so getting some kind of insight into their compositional structure. Uh, this is thing that uh, these are really big industries right now. As a person in the background with a background in radio astronomy, I'm trained to ask a question that comes up so often, there's even an animated GIF for it. <laughs> what about the magnetic fields of exoplanets? Can we learn about them, too? And uh, it would be really nice to. Um, so one thing is people talk a about a lot is habitability. And obviously, from the, our own solar system, we know that a planet's magnetic field have, plays a big role in its response to its space weather environment. Coronal mass ejections, uh, you know, uh, direct interactions with the stellar wind, things like that. So this is an animation from Ofer Cohen just showing a close-in planet. And what's happening here is this planet is so close that there's an interaction between its own magnetosphere and the magnetic field of its host star, leading to reconnection events, driving things like this big outflow. Um, one thing that I think is particularly cool is because the magnetic field is being generated by the planetary dynamo, uh, detecting it really gives us insight into the interior structure of the planet. Uh, so this is just a pretty much randomly chosen uh, animation of mantle convection in a rocky planet. And you can imagine uh, there's a relationship between convection in the core itself, which drives the dynamo, and in the mantle. So learning something about planet's magnetic field could actually tell you something about whether, say, it has active plate, to plate tectonics, like the Earth, or is inert, like Mars. 
So, how do we want to learn about the magnetic fields of exoplanets? There's a few different methods that people are working on. I want to argue that radio observations are going to be very important for this. First of all, uh, it's just a regime where the planet star flux ratio can actually be larger than one. Uh, so this is a plot of the radio spectra of various solar system objects. Uh, so here we have the sun when it's not active, decreasing down to around 10 megahertz here. And uh, here's Jupiter. And uh, Jupiter can be brighter than the sun. Even Earth can be brighter than the sun at kilometric, very long wavelengths. Um, and this is because the radio emission that you're getting from things like planets, this is auroral radio emission, which is coming from a coherent maser process where you get very high brightnesses with relatively low energy input. So despite the fact that you have a lot less, uh, the energy scale of the planet is a lot smaller, you can still get very bright emission. And another nice thing is that this emission carries a lot of physical information. Uh, so this plot here, this is a radio time frequency diagram. Uh, this isn't actual data, but it's derived from data. So we have the frequency over here going up and time progressing right to left. And so this auroral emission has a few characteristics that make it very useful. It's very beamed, so you end up getting a pulsar-like effect, where you have periodic radio bursts at the rotation period of the planet. Um, also, the frequency, the characteristic frequency of the radio emission turns out to be the cyclotron frequency of the magnetic field. So if you detect radio emission at a certain radio frequency, you can read off the magnetic field strength right away. And then this plot here is showing, in this particular uh, observation, there's three bursts that you see every rotation, which help you infer the fact that there are three magnetic loops where there's probably more magnetic loops, but these are the three where there's some kind of current system that's driving the auroral phenomenon. So basically, your temporal resolution can become spatial resolution, and you can learn about the magnetic field structure of the planet itself. Now, uh, we can't actually detect uh, exoplanetary magnetic fields through radio, or as far as I know, any other direct means yet. But we're working on it, and something that's really coming clear right now, which is just coming into focus, is that it turns out, kind of extraordinarily, that brown dwarfs are really, they really seem to be scaled up versions of the kind of auroral magneto-ionospheric current systems that we expect, or that we do see in solar system planets, and that we expect to see in extrasolar planets. Um, so I just like these plots, so this is the discovery of radio bursts from Jupiter back in 1955. Uh, this is Ito's discovery of radio bursts from the first brown dwarf in 2001. I kind of like the uh, visual analogy there. And uh, I can't show some other things because they're not published yet, but there's a few lines of observational evidence that are really indicating that there is a scaling over a factor of, say, 100 in mass. And one nice thing about the brown dwarfs is that the luminosities are much larger, and also the magnetic fields turn out to be much stronger, which brings the emission from very long wavelengths, sort of 10 megahertz, where you're even worrying about the ionosphere cutoff, up to the gigahertz regime, where we can use very powerful observatories such as the VLA. So while, we know, while we're waiting for the SKA low to get built, we can still make a lot of progress and work towards you know, understanding how we, how we get physics from these kinds of observations. That being said, while we can still observe brown dwarfs that are relatively warm and they seem to have analogous processes, we are interested in seeing how cool we can go. What the coolest brown dwarf we can detect is, how close we can get to the exoplanetary regime. Uh, the current gold standard is a T6.5 dwarf called 2 mass 1047 plus 21. Um, so it was first detected in a survey with Arecibo uh, with isolated radio bursts spread out over around a dozen observations over a course of 13 months. Uh, so these are more time frequency diagrams and these plots uh, integrate over frequency showing you these bursts that are evolving on kind of 100 second time scales. So quick radio bursts, but not fast radio bursts. Um, so, Arecibo has some limitations. Uh, you can't detect very faint quiescent emission uh, because it's a single dish. And because it can't point, you can only track things for about three hours at a time. So, uh, a couple years ago, we did a pilot study with the VLA. We didn't see any of these bursts, but we did uh, confirm radio emission at a quiescent level at uh, around 20 microjanskis, which is radio astronomer for very faint. Um, and that motivated a follow-up study where we decided we'd really see how much we could learn by staring at it with a VLA. So we did that, and uh, this is what we found. This is basically the radio light curve shown in a few ways. And uh, the, the first order result is we see radio bursts that seem to be spaced around periodically. And I want to emphasize that something like this or that, they don't look like much in this rendition, but this is around a seven sigma event, and this is kind of a three sigma event. And I'll carry on with this 
diag pointer. So this top panel here is showing the emission as a function of uh, Stokes type. So the red upward lines are Stokes total intensity, and the blue downward are Stokes circular polarization, Stokes V. So this is showing you that these radio bursts are basically 100% left circular polarized, which is what you expect given this coherent emission mechanism. Bottom panel, we're breaking it down by we have two frequency windows with a VLA. Um, and so there's five and seven gigahertz. And basically, the key thing here is, so obviously the pulse amplitude and structure varies with time, and so does the frequency structure if you break it down that way. Um, so uh, that can tell you something about sort of where the, where the emitting region is propagating as it moves. So that's averaging over the two spectral windows, so a mean frequency of six gigahertz. And so the one other thing you can see is, you know, these pulse, these peaks are pretty comparable. So it's a fairly flat spectrum, which again is a characteristic that you get with the uh, radio bursts. So, um, so something like this, where the pulse shape varies from one event to the next, it's a little bit hard, or you know, some kinds of ways of measuring a periodicity, it's not going to be a super precise value. Uh, but with phase dispersion minimization, we get a value of 1.77 hours with uncertainty of about 0.03 hours. Uh, oh yes, and I should say that, so these are, we have another batch of data that I'm not showing here, where you detect a radio pulse at 10 gigahertz, which again, you map that to the cyclotron frequency that tells you that the magnetic field strength of this 900 Kelvin object reaches around three kilogauss. Um, so or maybe a factor of eight warmer than Jupiter. We don't know the mass because we don't know the age, uh, but the magnetic field strength is around 200 times stronger. Because we have a rotation period, uh, we can see how the dynamo, how the magnetic field scales with rotation. This is something that is very relevant uh, in understanding how the actual dynamo process that generates the field works. Um, so what we're showing here is uh, radio spectral luminosity as a function of rotation as parameterized by V sine I. That's the measurement that we usually have. A lot of upper limits, uh, breaking it down green, red, blue for M, L, and T dwarfs. Uh, apologies if you're red green colorblind, but it doesn't really matter a whole lot anyway because there isn't much of a strong correlation. These vertical lines are the flares versus the quiescent mission. And the lack of this correlation is interesting in and of itself uh, because, say, for active stars, there's a very strong correlation between, say, rotation and X-ray luminosity, something that's very well trodden. Uh, in the regime where you have a fully convective dynamo, that seems like it may not hold as well. And there's a lot of debate, mainly in the geophysics community, about how the dynamo how it scales with, say, rotation. And the other thing I want to point out is uh, this is only the sixth rotation period measured for a late, uh, mid or late T-dwarf, and the other ones come from radio, or, sorry, from optical infrared monitoring, uh, where you're assuming, thank you, you're assuming that you're watching the cloud, or the, uh, you're watching inhomogeneities due to the clouds, and the clouds probably evolve on similar time scales, so you worry a lot about what you're measuring when you're seeing kind of stochastic variability with a certain time scale. Radio observations don't have that limitation. Uh, one other thing I quickly want to mention, tomorrow is CFA Hack Day. Uh, so basic idea is we want to create, we're having a space in the Wolbach Library. Ideally, just sit down and spend a day focusing on a problem. Do something that you wouldn't otherwise get to do, sitting in a room with people who know a lot about technology if, we, if you want to work on something technology related. Uh, you know, you can just build something cool, fix something that's been bothering you. Uh, obviously, you not know, everyone can afford to spend all day there, so there's a few uh, keep times in the morning. We'll get together, have some bagels and coffee from the fancy new bagel place. Um, people will discuss their projects, assemble the teams. We'll have pizza and some brief talks at lunchtime uh, in a format hopefully similar to what we're doing right now. And at the end of the day, people who've been working on things can summarize what they've been doing, show off what they've done, we can celebrate. If you've been hearing about getting Python and wondering whether they're right for you, don't talk to your doctor, talk to us. Um, we'll have office hours. You can swing by, ask questions if you're kind of curious about these tools. And uh, I just want to quickly show, um, so what I'm planning on working on is for, well, I've re-implemented all of tech in JavaScript uh, to make it render anything on archive into something that's a lot more re easily readable than a PDF, which is designed for printing on a little rectangular pages. Uh, talk to me tomorrow if you want to understand why I think this is reasonable. Uh, here's a summary of, what, of my points, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, 
Exactly, and a lot of people at the CFA are working on this. Um, I don't know if Ofer is around here somewhere. Um, but yeah, uh, both observationally and theoretically, there's a lot of work happening here um, on just that topic. One thing that comes up is uh, if a hot Jupiter is tidally locked, it's, you know, it's relatively rotating, rotating at a few days, which is relatively slow, and there's debate about whether that will stifle the dynamo. Again, it goes back to whether the dynamo the relationship between rotation and how the dynamo gets driven. So it may be that something in a hot Jupiter situation, its magnetosphere is relatively weak, but um, it's, we're really just beginning to understand these kinds of questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, uh, thank you for having me here. This is really a short talk about uh, uh, Type IA supernova in nearby galaxy M82. This is some nuclear explosion which happened uh, in the middle of January last year, and this became the very first uh, Type IA supernova which was detected in gamma rays. So this is on the right, on the left, this is optical image, and on the right, the gamma ray image, and 10 degrees, you can see the bar, and so the optical galaxy fits into one pixel in gamma ray images. Nevertheless, you see the signal here, and the question is why, of course, this became the first, very first uh, type of supernova detected in gamma rays, and the answer is here. This is, on the, this is energy, and this is the black line, is the quiescent background of the SPI instrument on board Integral Observatory, and the red thing is the theoretical prediction of the type 1a supernova spectrum at the distance of 3.5 megaparsec away. And so you see that there is quite a space between the background and the signal, and so it, it's not fun to just extract the signal. It took 8,000 times longer than the duration of this talk to get decent signal from the supernova. <laughs> okay, so that... Uh, so what most people want from type 1a supernova, they want them to be standard candle, and what is the definition of the standard candle? It is candle which is defined by some fundamental quantities. And, for example, the total mass, ideally, would be just Chandrasekhar mass, 1.4 solar masses. The expansion velocity should be of the order of 10,000 kilometers per second set, actually, by the energy release per nucleon during fusion of carbon and oxygen to heavy elements. This is also fundamental quantity. And the amount of radioactive nickel-56, which is synthesized during explosion, should be of the order of 0.6 solar masses. This is less fundamental quantity, which depends on the, how the material is burning. Okay, so that the expansion itself, the explosion, is powered by the thermonuclear sinters, but the rest, the emission which we see in optical and gamma ray band, is powered by the decay of nickel-56 into cobalt-56 on a time scale of nine days E uh, time decay, and uh, then cobalt-56 decays into stable iron-56 on the time scale of 100 days. And usually... Uh, this decay happens too fast, and so at that time the envelope is just too dense, and so the gamma rays does not escape at all. They are somalized and power optical emission. But uh, on the time scale of 100 days, the envelope is already transparent enough to see gamma rays, right? And so that if you want really to see the signal, you should concentrate on this uh, transition from cobalt 56 to iron 56. And this is a uh, scheme of decay of... Uh, a cobalt 56 with the half-life time 77 days, so that E folding time is uh, uh, 110 days. So it goes through, through ch two channels, electron capture and uh, uh, beta plus decay. And during beta plus decay, in 90% uh, cases, you produce uh, a positron. And in 100% cases, you produce the line, gamma ray line, at, at 147 keV. And in 68% cases, you produce the line at 1.2 meV. And those are the three most important observables you expect to see in gamma rays. Okay, and that the spectrum 
what we see. This is the energy in kilo electron volts, and this is the flux, and the red points is what we see. This is the line at uh, 847 keV. This is the line at 1.2 meV. We see those two lines, and the lines are much broader than the resolution of the instrument. So no question that they are broadened by expansion. The expansion is typical uh, uh, 10,000 kilometers per second. And there is also continuum, and there is just points. This is 511 keV the annihilation, uh, the rest mass of the positron or electron, and there is continuum there, which is formed by Compton scattering and uh, uh, ortopositronium decay. And unlike uh, optical emission, where the zillions of lines are actually making the calculations really just very hard, in, uh, in terms of gamma rays, the interaction of uh, gamma ray photons is fairly simple. There are three processes which affect the kind of propagation of uh, uh, gamma ray quanta through the ejector. This is photonization, and photonization dominated by heavy elements, basically by iron and heavy elements, so it's not like in interstellar medium. Coherence scattering on bound to electrons and incoherence scattering uh, on the same bound to electrons. And th what is shown here, this is the energy, and this is photoabsorption cross-section, this is incoherence scattering, and this is coherence scattering. And you see that below 100 keV, everything is absorbed by iron and other elements. And above, you have scattering, and during scattering process, of course, due to this is gamma rays, so there is significant recoil, so that uh, photons are losing their energy. This is about gamma rays. Uh, what about uh, positrons? The positrons, on average, have the mean energy of 600 kilo electron volts, and they do not annihilate right away. They instead slow down first by Coulomb collisions and by ionizations, and then they form, they capture wire charge exchange electron, which are plenty of electrons around, and they form positronium atom, which is basically hydrogen atom, but you replace the proton with the positron. And uh, by the uh, statistical weights, you form singlet state in one quarter of cases, and this state leaves 10 to the minus 10 seconds and decays into two 511Q photons, or you uh, form in three quarters of cases triplet state, where the selection rules forbid you to decay into two photons, so you leave 1,000 times longer, 10 to the minus seven seconds, and you decay into three photons. And this forms a continuum. And so what you expect, that the spectrum from the positro uh, positrons should look like a narrow line due to decay of uh, 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 parapositronium and uh, three photon decay continuum from the uh, ortopositronium. Okay, so that then you can just make a simple model, toy model, where you... Uh, model the ejector as a just uh, homologously expanding sphere with a uniform uh, chemical composition and the exponential distribution of density. And this is just driven by simplicity. You want to characterize everything only with three parameters, mass of the radioactive nickel, mass of the ejector, and its characteristic velocity. And what you can do is just uh, plug this into simple Monte Carlo, and you get the predicted uh, emergent spectrum. This is for day 75. This is energy. This is expected flux. The black line is the total flux you expect. And what you see, those are the most important lines. This is 847. This is 1.2 mV. And there is a uh, substantial probability that at this date, 60 or 64 percent of the gamma rays just go exactly without any interaction. And they are broadened by the just uh, expansion uh, velocity of the ejector. And then they form, uh, due to Compton scattering, a recoil effect, the continuum to the low side, the uh, red wing of the line. This is single scattering, this is uh, d uh, double scattering and multiple scattering. And then here, photoabsorption kills you. And then, in addition, there is 511 kV line, and this is ortopositronium continuum, uh, which is formed by three photon decay of the positrons. Okay, so that. You can then just compare this simple model, which is terribly wrong, in particular because of the chemical composition is not uniform, and uh, reactive elements, nickel, say, tends to be in standard model to be in the core, but yeah, this is the simplicity of the model. You can compare this with the spectrum, so that basically if the flux of the lines tells you what is the amount of nickel, the broadening tells you what is the velocity, and the absorption effects and opacity effects tell you what is the mass of the ejector. And after just uh, uh, searching uh, with these three parameters, the best written model, you come to the conclusion that the nickel mass is 0.6 solar mass, plus minus 0.1. The ejector mass is 1.3 solar masses with a large error, 
and the characteristic expansion velocity is 3,000 kilometers per second. This is the parameter of the exponential model. In order to convert it into the characteristic expansion velocity, you have to multiply by square root of 12, which brings you to 10,000 kilometers per second. Okay, and so that you can also, this is simple model, trivial model, just toy model, but you can, can compare always with the more detailed calculations of the uh, explosion nuclear synthesis in the models, and uh, this is the list of popular models, the typical uh, mass of nickel, mass of the ejector, and explosion energy, and then you calculate, well, by introducing uh, this model into the uh, fit, uh, uh, how the chi-square improves, so the larger the number, the better the quality of the model, and what you can see, you can divide into two groups. This group is uh, discouraged. This is, uh, detour is a pure detonation model when you convert the whole star into nickel-56. And the reason why it uh, performs poorly is because it produces huge amount of nickel. And because in no distance, there are no free parameters. We just calculate the model and we compare it with the observation. This is instead a uh, subject-dressecker model, which produces too few nickel, just, and the flux will be fainter. Other models are just canonical models, which include the top one is the uh, uh, Namoto model of uh, 84. This is one-dimensional deflagration model. It produced just very good results. And other models are delayed detonation model, which are the kind of uh, more uh, uh, favorite uh, current status. And they all produce similar results. And of course, the reason that they, they all produced uh, more or less similar amount of nickel. Okay, and so that I come to my conclusions, I think I'm on time, that uh, in terms of in gamma rays, it looks like just perfect, uh, normal uh, type 1a supernova. The gamma ray, we do see gamma ray lines of cobalt 56, and the most important one, we can determine relatively precisely the uh, amount of nickel, uh, radioactive nickel, which is 0.6 plus 1 is 0.1. So we, from the expansion velocity, which is set by broadening of the line, we just get uh, natural estimates 0.6 MeV, which is yeah, what you expect. And the mass of the ejector is 1.3, so the mass is plus minus large error. And we also see evidence for the uh, uh, positronium annihilation in the ejector. That's kind of consistent with the what people think, right? And so that uh, we still are not able to answer the question whether it's single progenitor or double progenitor. This, the answer shouldn't come from the gamma ray data, at least of that quality. So we don't see much velocity asymmetry on top of the what should be introduced by the opacity effects and the expansion. And although we know that the positrons uh, annihilation is taking place, we don't know what fraction of positrons escape. Okay, that's kind of the, of course, first example. We can't see supernova much further away than 3.5 megaparsecs. But there is always a chance that supernova will explode in our uh, galaxy. And as you know, that at 3.5 megaparsec, the uh, occurrence rate is comparable with the lifetime of typical mission. In our galaxy, it's comparable with the time scale of, uh, yeah, lifetime of a person. So that if the medical uh, things will get improved, <laughs> there is a chance to observe it. And for example, uh, Kepler supernova was 300 times brighter than the uh, this supernova. So there is a chance to really study everything in detail. Thank you. So we checked actually photoionization uh, or dissociation rate, photoionization rate, and it's not enough. So that it's not enough. Yeah, maybe at the beginning, at the very beginning, but so uh, once we uh, they start to gamma rays start to escape, it's not enough uh, density of uh, uh, photons to. Uh, uh, no. Well, uh, I don't want to editorialize, but I think there should have been a news and views. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, l let me show you the quote of this, just to, well, I actually, so I'm a bit embarrassed. Yesterday I was showing Chandra pictures to people who are producing them, and now I have to talk about Type 1 Supernova in front of you. <laughs>
Yeah. So there were uh, just uh, uh, approximately at the same time, there was a paper by Ronald Dill, which uh, concentrated on the very early stage, basically the first observations which happened, well, uh, uh, 16 days after the explosion. And what they claim, that they see uh, uh, emission of nickel lines. Yeah. And it's only possible if the nickel is not in the core, but actually on the surface. And from this, you can just, well, make two conclusions. First, that, for example, the explosion started from the surface, or there is just violent something which brings, well, make the, uh, some pieces transparent. And what I can say that, uh, well, I was looking carefully at the data. I don't see any compelling evidence, I mean, statistical significant evidence for those lines. That's it. So that. Well, I mean, so that I'm one side. You should have Roland here, and then uh, we can discuss it a bit more. It's 1.3 plus minus large margin because it's, yeah, we, we only through the opacity we, we, we have a feeling. 1.3, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, well, the, so we, we do include them into the models, right? But we don't have individual limit on the relative abundance of cobalt-57 relative to the cobalt-56. Cobalt-57 has much longer lifetime, and so that it's supposed to show up, and actually, so that you can see, see yeah, th this is, this is from cobalt-57, it's coming, but so we don't have enough sensitivity. Oh, this is one of the, so I just, well, I mentioned only those two, but there is yet another line, and actually more lines out there which are characteristic for the cobalt uh, uh, to uh, iron decay. Do you have an upper limit for that middle line? Well, y y you can see, it's right there. Well, so that, that's what I call uh, not compelling evidence uh, of the line. This is compelling and this is not. This is marginally. And why I'm talking about uh, uh, contribution of positrons, because this is actually the low energy part of the spectrum. This part is due to uh, recoil effect and Compton scattering, and this part is due to the positrons. And so that they are comparable order, and so should one of these components be missing, the flux will be lower. This is marginally uh, compelling. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Selma. I'll talk later today more about massive stars. This is one of my uh, uh, side interests. Uh, I'm not a full expert on this, but uh, this is a really interesting problem. And I think uh, if you're not aware of this, uh, it, it, it's really an area where you can, I think, still contribute a few ideas because uh, uh, it's a very tough problem. So globular clusters, as we know, old stellar populations circulating uh, most uh, galaxies. Uh, star clusters, we thought of them as the best place to test stellar evolution because a star cluster is supposed to form out one uh, gas cloud at once, and that gas cloud should have one composition. And so in the language that people use in this community, it should be a simple stellar population. One age that characterizes its coeval population and one composition. And it turns out these things are not so simple. And so this evidence for this comes from two lines. Uh, partially it comes from photometry, especially from a data taken with HST, and this uh, really accurate photometry if you zoom in on these uh, stellar populations and you plot them in a uh, color magnitude diagram, you see that there's many populations there and it's not one isochrone that fits this. And so also from the abundance side, uh, if you take direct measurements of spectra of these stars, uh, not me, but the people in this field working on this, you see that some of the stars have normal abundances, very similar to the stars in the halo, and a lot of stars have strange abundances, 
uh, strange in, for example, oxygen and sodium in a way that's anti-correlated. Uh, and if you remember your nuclear physics from your stellar evolution course one day, CNO cycling, when you burn hydrogen, CNO cycling is what makes uh, anti-correlations like this. So these stars are polluted with something that has been processed by hydrogen burning. So how did this happen? Uh, there's a community, oh, so, uh, yeah, there's different composition, different in age, potentially. About the composition, the community definitely agrees. Whether it's a real difference in age and how large it is, there is a lot of debate about that. Uh, because we cannot measure the age directly for these old globular clusters. They're a few giga years old. Uh, for younger counterparts, there have been claims that there is a spread in age. Uh, but that is, uh, so there's a small intermezzo in this. Is there real evidence for age spread? It's a good question to, uh, to ask. This is one of the main evidence for age spread. This is the turnoff. I, I zoomed in on one of the turnoffs of these globular clusters, actually the one there on the top. So this area, so the stars are very spread around the turnoff, and if you fit an isochrone to this, there would be an age spread of 400 million years if you interpret it this way. Um, so one of the thoughts we put forward is maybe these isochrones are a bit too simple. If you include rotation in these isochrones, you can actually uh, make stars a little bit cooler or have a different colors. Uh, so this is what we proposed. This is a younger, this is not a globular cluster, this is a younger uh, version of it, and the turnoff mass of this cluster is like one and a half solar mass. Turns out stars of that mass are typically pretty fast rotators. This is the diagram on the top is data for nearby stars. Um, and so we put forward a very simple toy model to show you can get spreads like that, uh, which was a, a fun idea just to put forward as an idea. These models are uncertain, so uh, it's not the last word. There's now a debate going on whether we model this well enough or not, with people uh, in favor in front. But uh, all I wanted to say, it's not clear how, long, how big the age spreads really are in these clusters. So let's return to the old globular clusters. How do we form them? So there's many ideas out there. People are pretty desperate to form these different populations. So let me summarize this in a really simplified way. My cartoon version that is summarizing most of the models out there. Uh, so we start with one gas cloud. Uh, generation of stars is forming. Uh, the, probably the primordial gas is uh, dispersed. But the most massive stars, they eject some of their material. And that's the material enriched in hydrogen burning processed material. That's green in this area, as you uh, obviously understand. Uh, and so this material, in some of the scenarios, would stay in the center. It's very puzzling how it could do that, but it would stay there. And then you form a second generation of stars out there. Uh, and voila, we have a po stellar population with two uh, generations. And maybe we lose a few of the first generation. And so what I should have pointed out on the first slide, these two populations, the most intriguing puzzle is that these two populations uh, are of equal size. And so this is bringing up um, uh, different problems. So first, these scenarios differ a lot in which stars are polluting this cluster. So who are the suspects of this? And so the most popular one in the community has always been the AGB stars. It's very nice because they have very slow winds, so they might actually stay within the potential of the cluster. Many caveats with this, but, but the best part is that they have, they're very slow and have at least qualitatively the right pos uh, composition. A second idea in the community is that actually very fast rotating stars, which may shed material from the equator. If you're familiar with BE stars, that is what people are thinking of. Uh, and uh, so we thought of binaries uh, because it's, uh, well, uh, that's my favorite, I think. Uh, I think they're very promising, and I'll uh, sh show you a few things about that. Uh, so the difference in these scenarios is when do they uh, pollute this cluster. The spin stars would be the most massive stars in the first 5 million years. The binary stars could do it roughly the first 20 million years. The AGB stars would do it after 100 year million years, roughly. And so all these things have problems. Um, uh, the AGB stars, they would imply this very large age spread, and they would imply that there would be a uh, phase of star formation going on very late in the evolution of the cluster. Every cluster we look at around the age where this should be happening, we see no evidence for this whatsoever. So this is challenging, uh, and there's problems with the abundances, but I think that we can maybe relate to details in the models. For the spin stars, it's tough because all these stars have to be rapidly rotating. Or it's, it's very tough to get enough material from these stars. Uh, the binaries, uh, well, you need a lot of stars in binaries. I don't think that is necessarily a problem, but uh, I, I think none of these is fully uh, favorable because in all these systems, the problem is the mass budget. How do I take some material of some of the stars and then make a second generation out of it that has more stars than I had in the first generation? And so this, this plot is actually a way to visualize this. This is a strange way to plot the IMF. This is the IMF weighted by mass. So surface area in this diagram tells you how much mass is locked up in stars at maybe one million years after star formation, 
when the stars are formed, just inside the stars. And so it turns out if you have an IMF up to 120, which is maybe not right, but that's a different story, uh, then 38% of the mass is in the stars that we still see today. How much can HB stars eject? They can eject the envelope, and that accounts about 9% of the stellar mass at birth. So making out of 9% of the mass, making a new generation that is equally massive or populous as these long-lived stars is a tough problem. Same for the spin stars. Um, and this is assuming that all these stars contribute. Uh, binaries, I think, uh, do it a little bit better because get, they can do it all over the range if most of these stars are in binary systems. Uh, that's what we proposed earlier. Um, uh, so the binaries might be a promising candidate. Uh, well, because we know that in nearby loose open associations already a lot of stars uh, will undergo interaction. Uh, these global clusters is crazy. The densities are so high, it will be very hard for a star not to interact with another star. And secondly, they have a method also to produce these uh, elements. Um, when a star interacts with another star, the outermost layers will be dumped on the second star. But the deeper layers, the layers that we want, that have been processed, uh, they will probably be shed inside in a, a circumbinary disk. This is the cartoon picture of it. Uh, we ran a, a model to, uh, to, tr to look at these hypotheses, uh, to check this. And we do find all these anti-correlations. So the helium would be rich. Carbon would be depleted, nitrogen would be rich, oxygen would be depleted, sodium would be enhanced. And these are the, in, qualitatively at least the anti-correlations that you uh, predict. Uh, so they are, should be considered as one of the candidate progenitors. Uh, but it doesn't solve the mass problem still. And so the last idea we put forward, which is still uh, pretty uh, uh, hand-waving at this stage, and I would like to invite uh, anyone who wants to model this in more detail uh, to step in here, so, but there's a new scenario, and the main uh, lead author there is Nate Bastian, my collaborator. And so this is a scenario which is uh, not needing uh, multiple formation uh, mechanisms. So in the first part, I said there's two ways in which massive stars can contribute. And massive stars would deliver this material in the first 20 million years of the star cluster, so very early in the star cluster. And so that changes a few things. So we still start with one star, uh, with one uh, gas cloud, that forms the first generation but now we have to realize that the most massive stars are already burning, but the low mass stars that are still alive today, they are pre-main sequence stars at this phase. So they are convective, so it would be very nice if we could accrete onto these pre-main sequence stars. And so the idea is that, oh yeah, so these are the time scales. The two solar mass stars actually take around six million years to, uh, uh, to uh, contract and end up the main sequence. Six million years, your first stars are already, the massive stars are already exploding. And so, Let's say that these massive stars shared material, maybe because they're binaries or because they're spinning, but uh, that, that will be open in this question. So let's say they share this material, then some of these pre-main sequence stars may accrete from this material and be enriched. Uh, so the back of the envelope calculation to do this through bonnie hollow accretion is not very efficient. Uh, it will work very well if these stars still have their protoplanetary proto disk around them or their formation disk, because they may can actually sweep up the material. Um, so this is pretty rough, but uh, interesting that 40% of the Loma stars spend a significant amount of time in the center, where we think this material will be mostly residing. And uh, by taking disk sizes, I don't remember which size we took, but we, we took a reasonable size for the disk that's a bit smaller than a normal environment. You actually swipe out this entire center 40, uh, 40 times in the 20 million years. Um, uh, so this would be once, uh, one way to enrich part of your own population, which means you don't have two generations of star formation. It's one generation of star formation which enrich some of the stars. And so this, this could actually be a solution to this mass budget problem. You don't make a second generation. You agree onto the seeds you already have, which means you need much less of this material. So there's many open questions on this story. Uh, the only thing I wanted to uh, contribute in these 10 minutes is that I think it's promising. And so the... Uh, this is what I would leave you with. Maybe these global clusters are simple stellar populations after all. So, thanks. So we see these patterns in every globular cluster we look at. So we can invoke the scenario, but we need to invoke it for uh, all the globular clusters to have merged. 
uh, I think if you merge two globular clusters, it would be, I don't know if that fits with the current, um, so one of the observ observational consequences would probably be that you see some rotation in the clusters today. Um, so I don't know if this fully defies uh, the, the observations out there, but uh, it would be hard. Yeah, true. Yeah. I have a question. So Nate posted a paper in your MEP comments. Yeah, I know. But his most recent paper basically is, I think the conclusion is that all of the, all of these models fail. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, so, the, you so if you go into the detailed abundances, it's very hard to make the pick. Well, there's many questions that, to make it work. But just one of the many questions is the detailed abundances. And the range of these abundance patterns, they vary from cluster to cluster. And that's not easy to do with, uh, with these scenarios. So Nader has a paper uh, last week in which he states none of the scenarios work, which is maybe. Uh, so on the stellar model side, I, it, it's hard to make such strong statements because the, nuclear, uh, the treatment of the nuclear processes is uncertain, which material you get out is uncertain. There's stochasticity in these high mass stars. It depends what kind of binaries you have. Uh, there's another proposal that I didn't put here, but people think about uh, a very massive star in the center that is actually undergoing multiple collisions. So not only two stars interacting, but multiple stars interacting. Having one or not can give you variations from cluster to cluster. So, um, when, you, when you say detailed abundances, what abundances are they? Are they S process or are they just normal uh, elements? No, it's the only elements that vary are elements that come from the CNO cycle and the advanced change. So, yeah. so you're saying it's complicated enough for his statement not to be robust. <laughs> I think this is a nice area for theorists. You can still uh, say a few things without being disproven right away. <laughs> so in the last scenario that you propose, um, don't you worry that the massive stars will go supernova and blow up the gas before yeah. the low-mass stars have a chance to decrease? So we all worry about this. And this, this is initially people thought of the AGB stars as being this beautiful uh, delivering their mass in this safe moment in time in which all the core collapse have come off and the 1A staff have not really picked up well, if you came to my talk earlier, I don't think it's, uh, there might be still core collapses going on during that time. Uh, it's not clear how much material you can retain. If material is shattered by binaries inside a disk, which is still relatively dense, it's not clear to me how much of the material you actually accelerate or whether most of the explosion uh, can uh, escape through lower density regions or lower density chimneys. So this, there's nobody modeling this at the moment in... Uh, three dimensions and doing this uh, more accurately. Well, I, I think this should be possible, at least to first extent. So this is, I think, one of the reasons I, uh, I like to uh, see if more people can uh, join and uh, contribute something to this field. But this is one of the main worries. One of the things proposed is that it's the most massive stars that pollute and that they might not really give uh, explosions because they all fall back to black holes. That's one of the things put forward there. Uh, so I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, how opacities are affecting the kilonova light curves. And so to give this talk, I'm going to have to first tell you what our neutron star mer what, what, what kilonova are and how they're associated with neutron star mer mergers, our process, advanced LIGO. I'll, I'll go through and then talk about deriving the kilonova signal and see what we can get from putting all of the, all this information all together into one thing. So first, let's start off and talk about what what I mean by kilonova. So there's quite a few binaries out there that are produced that are two neutron stars that eventually will merge in, um, in reasonable time, Hubble time being reasonable, um, in, through gravitational wave emission. When they merge, they produce several things. We, we're pretty well convinced, thanks to um, um, Fong and Berger, that these are, are from, uh, they're producing short duration gamma ray bursts. We're also getting more and more even the skeptics of our process from neutron star mergers 
more and more believing that these are a primary source for our process. Even with Caxton and Yang Shin are willing to admit that they might dominate the R process yields. Um, the, they also, what we're thinking might be a major source for advanced LIGO to see for gravitational wave detections. So they're important, you know, important for a wide variety of fields. Um, you will get them in any in meetings in nuclear physics all the way through um, uh, meetings on gravitational waves. Um, unfortunately, it, so it would give, be very exciting if you saw these, you get to see the merger, you see the gravitational waves, and you see the optical light. There's some kind of electromagnetic uh, signal. The problem is that these mergers, if they produce short duration bursts, if they're directed at you, you will see them. They're pointed right at you. They're going to be bright um, gamma ray bursts because they're going to be nearby. Unfortunately, for advanced LIGO, most of the bursts, they, they will detect them even if they're not pointed at us. So most of the advanced LIGO uh, gravitational wave detections will be mergers that are not pointed at us. So at some point, uh, Lee and Pachinsky in 1998, but Brian Metzger has been a real pusher of this, and there's a good review in Metzger and Berger 2012, argued that I had these mergers, I eject radioactive material, and it's not as mundane as this nickel-56. It's a, a wide range of R-process um, nucleides. They get ejected, and they will radioactively decay and power some light curve. So that's what we want to study. And the problem with this, and I'm going to go right to the punch on passages right up front, the problem is this is then the opacities are much more complex. If we were, okay, if we were happy and observed them in gamma rays, we'd be done, because it's fairly simple. The opacities are fairly simple up there. But for the, um, for the optical and the infrared, the opacities are much more difficult to calculate. Um, so not surprisingly, uh, it turns out that there's a lot of atomic physicists at Los Alamos that study these heavy elements. I will tell you, they had never envisioned getting these heavy elements at densities of 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13 grams per centimeter cube. They're used to densities of 1, 1 to 10, you know, even higher. So they had not actually studied the opacities at these low densities and these temperatures. So we put them to studying this. So the, uh, I've, I'm working with a guy named Chris Fonts. He does a lot of the opacities at Los Alamos. He takes the, the codes that he knows how he's doing. He modifies them so he can calculate these low densities. And he starts calculating the opacities. And the first pass he did was these green opacities. Um, and if you look carefully, they're not so different than what Dan Kaysen produced with, uh, it's I think the paper is Barnes and Kaysen, in studying the opacities. There's lots of lines. There's lots of structure. Um, but if you, if you sum up this opacity, when you get below about uh, 0.2, I mean, 0.3 or 4 EV, the opacity starts to disappear. This is for one element. This is just for Sumerian Z equals 62 ele um, element. So it gets low as you get down to this 0 0.2, 0 0.1 EV range. There's not, you know, the opacity is now dropping to roughly what you might get with electron scattering. So it's, it's, it's pretty even below. So it's actually not that high of an opacity. Um, then Chris Fonts tells me, yeah, but we're throwing a lot away a lot of the line structure. So the problem with these heavy elements, if you're doing the hydrogen atom as you did when you were an undergrad, you know, there's only a, you didn't have to worry about that many levels. There's not that many lines. For, for these heavy elements, there's a lot of levels you can consider, and the codes actually just ignore a lot of them. So th what they do is they do a trick where they say, well, the, the sum over the whole thing has to be the same. But generally, they put that sum in these higher, uh, these higher um, photon energies, so between 1 and 10. And you can see the green lines are higher up there. And so the sum over the whole surface is right. But if they really wanted to do it correctly, they would have to do something more detailed. So what I convinced them to do is say, each of these lines is broadened, but can include them all. Keep the surface of each line done right, but include all the lines. And there were a whole bunch of fine lines in this range where when they added those lines into the calculation, this black line is the curve that they get for the opacity. And the reason this should concern you is now at 0.1 EV, I went from around an opacity of 0 0.01 centimeter squared per gram to about, you know, over about one centimeter squared per gram. And that's a much higher opacity. And as you might expect, that changes the light curve. So this is us, the, the latest calculations of these light curves if I assume that the ejecta is all these high R process elements, so that you, you merge these objects, you've suddenly just ejected a whole bunch of in tides, a whole bunch of material that's neutron rich, it's all going to go to the R process. If I assume it all does, this is what I get for the light curves in the optical, the near infrared, and infrared, 
and the difference between the dot and dash, the, the dotted lines and the solid lines, or if you're looking at it face on or edge on. But this is the kind of light curves that you get. And really what it says is even in the near infrared, it's hard to get something that's bright, this is in log time, bright above about one day. And, and then it starts going down. And my, for me, bright is you know, less than 10 to the 41 ergs um, per second, um, which is actually quite dim for some of the past calculations of these kilonode light curves. So this is the situation you're at, we were at, where you, you looked at this and you said, OK, if we do a more careful calculation of the opacities, we look at the yields. If we assume it's just a simple merger and you look at the tidal ejecta and you just say it's all our process, this is the kind of answer you get. So what is the way around it? What are we doing wrong? And I think, again, um, some of the interesting features here are coming from um, uh, thinking about the problem bigger as a whole. I had this neutron star merger. My assumption is it's making our process. It's from this tidal ejecta, and that's what's powering the light curve. The issue is that's not the whole story. So there's a couple other things that happen, and Metzger and Fernandez and Fernandez et al. have done studies on this, and here's the issue. I do get this tidal. I, a neutron star merger happens. Material is ejected in, in, from this, this tidal forces, so you get this tidal ejecta. If I have a hot, heavy, you know, it's a heavy neutron star in the center, it's blowing a wind, so it's driving more mass loss. It also has a disk around it that can be, can have mass loss. The new neutrinos will actually reset the electron fraction, how neutron rich this ejecta is. And so they can alter what the yield is. And so you can end up getting something where you have, some of the yield will be low, you know, low electron fraction. That is, they're really, mostly neutrons. So this dynamical ejecta will have a lot of neutrons in it, and it's going to make our process. But there can be ejecta in the, in, from the disk and from this heavy neutron star that are, that are actually is a lot, lot less neutron rich. That will, instead of producing a whole bunch of you know, our process elements, lower elements like iron, iron peak elements. And from these iron, closer to iron peak elements, you have the opacities that are much lower in that optical and near infrared range and you can get a brighter signal. So the, the whole story is going to have to, is going to entail us understanding what is that compact, that remnant in the center. Is it a neutron star or has it collapsed to a black hole? So we decided to do a study of that. We said, okay, what happens when these merge? And what you can do is you can ask the people that do these mergers, Stefan Roswag, Ola Korobkin, have done whole series of models of merging different mass neutron stars, a one solar mass neutron star with a two solar mass neutron star, a 1.4 solar mass neutron star with a 1.4 solar mass neutron star. You can look at that, that whole set of um, systems and say, what are, what's the fate of those neutron stars? And the only piece that you need to know beyond that is what is your equation of state? Um, and, you know, I, I'm maybe not the brightest person in the world, but I thought we actually knew something about equations of state. We don't. So we know that the most, we know that the equation of state has to produce a neutron star that's more than two solar masses. That's not from the equation of state. That's not from dense matter nuclear physicists. That's from the observations. That's from people like Demarest. So that's from the observations. I thought for sure they had some other limit. We do know that you, they, you can't make a, a neutron star more than the Ruffini, Rhodes Ruffini limit, which is 4.8. And in fact, there's arguments where you can't make it even, you know, above about three point something. But it's, you, the right answer is probably somewhere between two and three um, is solar masses is the maximum neutron star mass. We don't know what it is. In fact, we went, so I worked with Sanjay Reddy and Andrew Steiner and a whole group of people and said, what do these form? And here's the fates of all these, for different mergers, these are different um, systems. Here's the fates of the systems. I, I don't want to have you worry about much more of this other than we can get things that form black holes immediately, they form black holes after some accretion time, or they stay as neutron stars. Once we get this, we can go look at the Fernandez et al. results and figure out what the yields are and calculate accurate light curves. And so as a conclusion, I just, the interesting feature of that is I can then plug that into population synthesis models which we did with Chris Botinsky and ask, what does that tell us about the equ equation of state when you do that study? And the interesting feature is, probably the biggest uncertainty we have there is what is the formation mass of neutron stars. But if you drive that out, it turns out that either with the population synthesis models, if I pick an equation of state maximum non-rotating mass, 
It's a fairly steep drop from forming almost 100% black holes to almost 100% neutron stars. So when we look at these light curves, if we can tell the difference, if we can get that number of, you know, the fraction of systems, if we can see a difference between the systems that make neutron stars and have, you know, lower neutron fractions versus those that are black holes and have only that R process signature, we can actually place a, a constraint on the maximum non-rotating, you know, uh, maximum mass for a non-rotating neutron star. And so that's, that's where I'll end. So, so there is another way, and that's to do some experiments and try to test your code. And we actually do this at Los Alamos. Um, the, the, perhaps what should depress you is, and this came out in a Nature paper recently, um, we did a simple experiment just to do iron, which is much simpler than these heavy elements. Um, and the idea of the experiment is we put some either iron and magnesium or iron and aluminum in a thin layer, and we we drove an explosion that we then illuminated this, this material with to look at the opacities. And um, this is done by uh, the paper that I grabbed this from was Nagayama, but the experimentalist leading this project is Jim Bailey in Sandia National Lab. It turns out that uh, um, none of our codes match the experimental data, which and, and that's including the, the university codes. So we're all maybe don't know what we're talking about. but. <laughs> But, but the good news for you is that because of this result, we're actually designing more experiments. I think there's going to be more code comparison, more trying to understand the physics. I actually would argue to you that, um, so my, my role right now at Los Alamos, we have our service work. My service work is I'm the PI of the radiation flow experiments, which this is under that venue. Um, what I found is that I thought, you know, I thought I didn't trust astronomy observations because of all the uncertainties. It turns out that some of the laboratory experiments have more uncertainties than some of the astronomy observations I, I, I've ever done. And, and so I think it's actually the experiment. We need to understand the experimental uncertainties better. If you are wrong, then all of us are in danger. Yeah, yeah. So, are, are we in danger, or is that a good thing? It means that maybe they won't. Well, I don't know. I, we're going to we're going to lines I'm not supposed to talk about, yeah. <laughs> In principle, yes. The problem with the, you know, if I say I'm looking at just a single star and asking, I collapsed a 40 solar mass star, what is its fate? That has a lot to do with the supernova engine mechanism, which, and this one, mergers are a little bit simpler. You merge them and you have a core mass and you can get that. And, and although there's some disagreements in what people are getting in the merged calculations, they're a lot less then what do I do when I do a collapse thing and decide what, what succeeds or fails? So this is a little bit cleaner um, system. In fact, it's a much cleaner system than the, you know, trying to understand this through core collapse. Um, but that, it, you know, you're right. We should be looking at that in core collapse and see if we can make some constraints there. The, the problem with core collapse is there's a lot of other pieces of physics that m matter, whereas in the neutron star merger, you can get away with the simple neutrino transport physics because it's it, the neutrino energy deposition is not that doesn't make a big difference. So you can get away with some simplifications that you can't get away with the core collapse engine. Uh, so you have too much R process that gives you too much opacity, but if you, say, reduce the R process by raising YE, you're also reducing the radioactive heating. So is there kind of a fine balancing point where you can get enough heating and not too much opacity? So we haven't done this, but the, yeah, the thing that we need to do is play around with um, I mean, the, the, the issue is we, we still, I think we're still fine with that, especially if I end up converting it to mostly nickel 56, I still have a nice power source. But even then, the, the plan that, and 
most of this is a lot of these ideas Brian Mesker has been pushing with you know, or, or people like um, Fernand, you know Fernandez and, and company. But if I can make a layer where I've lowered the opacity, it doesn't you know the energy will come out into that layer, and then I've changed the photosphere so it looks like I can see you know it gives me the right flux. So yeah, I think the idea that they're pushing mostly is making having a layer that has a, a photosphere such that optical and IR are, are a little bit stronger. That's the red or blue uh, uh, thing in. Uh, the paper that I cited here uh, of Metzger and Fernandez. Thank you very much.